Good morning, and as always, a very warm welcome to our service of worship here in Presswick South, and a warm welcome if you get any visitors with us this morning during the summer months. If you are a visitor, then we're glad that you're here, and please join us for tea and coffee in the hall at the close of the service. And also, as always, very warm welcome to those that are joining us by live stream, wherever they are for this service of worship. Indeed, we all unite together as we come with our service and our praise before God. And therefore, to commence, we begin by singing hymn 194, words on the screen, This is the Day. If you were tuned in last week or you were in church, you would have noted that the the service was entitled Postcard from the Northeast, and it was simply because Fiona and I had recently been in the Northeast on holiday, and I was using some of the recollections of that particular location um, to be central to the service of worship. And this morning, I'm going to attempt to do the same with the the first part, because I'm aware that when we go on holiday, then generally we will be attracted to certain tourist locations. Um, For example, Stirling Castle, and I would imagine that most people here at one time in their life have visited Stirling Castle. And I have to say that we actually visited it again. I've been to it once or twice, but visited it again recently when we were coming back down towards Presswick. And obviously, Stirling Castle uh, is a very impressive building and draws thousands upon thousands of tourists every year. Of course, it's not just buildings that attract people. And depending on who you're with, whether it's children or grandchildren, then obviously you can be drawn to a beach. And here in Presswick, we have our own beach. So you can be drawn to the beach, particularly if you've got children, grandchildren, whatever. And I often think when I think of beaches that God must have a sense of humor 
Um, Scotland has got so many beautiful beaches, and uh, you think of the climate at times, it's not always uh, sunshine, and then you think of how cold the sea is. Um, and I'm really amazed these days, you know, one of the, the things that everyone seems to be into these days is swimming in the sea at all times of the year. And all I can say is rather them than me. But we do have beaches and we do have a God with a sense of humor that's given us so many lovely beaches in Scotland. People are also attracted to certain things that have been built uh, to have a specific remit. For example, we have in Scotland the fourth rail bridge, and um, I would use the word regarding that as iconic. It is a very iconic structure. I'm not aware of anything else in the world that looks like that. And when people come across to Scotland, um, then they will often visit Queen's Ferry and see the bridge. And it's also accompanied these days by two road bridges as well. But even for us who live in Scotland, I'm sure growing up the first time we were able to see the fourth rail bridge. It's such an impressive sight, and no wonder it attracts many, many people through the year. Of course, coming back to buildings that are attractive to people, sometimes it's not castles, beaches, or monuments, etc. It can be stately homes where we can go back in time and see how people used to live in the past, and that's Hopton House just outside Edinburgh, which potentially or possibly many of you have had the chance to visit through the years. But away from all these things, again, perhaps with regards to children, other places you can visit are theme parks. And to visit theme parks, you obviously have to have a, a, a certain nature that likes heights, and speed and everything else. And let's be honest, we're not all into theme parks. And uh, generally these days, it can be something that you will only go to if there's younger people pulling you along. We have all of these things, and you can see the attraction on them with regards to them. The, there's something about them. The pull is, we want to see them, we want to experience them. But sometimes we can be pulled to visit certain locations with very ordinary attractions. In holiday, one of the places we visited was this lovely location. It's Pennon up in the northeast. There you can see it's right on the shoreline, and it is a very lovely location. And if you look a wee bit closer at the village, you can see there's nothing much there apart from the kind of shoreline, the promenade, one or two houses, etc. behind. And if you go even closer, you will notice if you are of a certain vintage um, that there's something in that, that actual photograph that draws people to pen and every year. And it is, of course, it's the phone box. Yeah, it's the phone box. And the reason that the phone box draws people closer is because of that film. And again, if you are of a certain vintage, um, which includes me, uh, you may remember the film, Local Hero. I remember going to the cinema to see it. And if you are aware of the film, it used Pennon as the location for the village. And the film was all about an American company wanting to come across to Scotland to more or less buy the village and develop an oil refinery. And to some of the people in the village, this was going to be a get-rich-quick uh, way of doing things. For others, they wanted the status quo. And there was a central character, his name was Mac, and he came from the States to represent the company. And when he arrived in Scotland, he 
stayed in the village making contact, etc., and in a sense negotiating on behalf of the large company back in the States. But he obviously had to keep his boss up to date with how things were going. Now, this film was 1983. It was the day or the days before mobile phones. And so, just about every day, Mac would go into the phone box with his coins, put his coins in, and make a call back to the States where he would speak to his boss and give him an update on what was happening in Scotland. And because of that, and because of the success of the film, the phone box today, in a sense, is a major tourist attraction. I have to say, I don't normally show pictures of myself on the screen like everyone else. I don't really like to do it. But just to show you <laughs> that I got to the phone box, there you go. That was taken just a good few weeks ago. And yeah, uh, that shows that I actually managed to get to the place that I wanted to visit. And that was the phone box in Pennon. Now, you know, just imagine speaking to folk that know, don't know anything about local heroes, and they say to you, did you visit anything um, specific or any great tourist attractions on holiday? And well, I can say that I went to Stirling Castle. I visited one or two places up in the northeast, which were also attractive locations. But then imagine saying, well, I visited a phone box. If they know nothing about Pennon, if they know nothing about Local Hero, um, they'll wonder what it's all about. And yet that phone box is very, very special to a lot of people of that era. And that phone box has become incredibly famous through the years. And it just shows you that if you take something ordinary and you use it in an appropriate way, then it can make its mark on society. And that's exactly what that phone box in Pennon has been able to achieve. And when I was thinking about it, it reminds me that, you know, there's so many people in the Bible and so many different things that have become famous because of the way they were used by God and Jesus. Ordinary things, ordinary people, but we know about them today because of what they were able to accomplish. And one example of that is, of course, the feeding of the 5,000. If you think about it, what you have there is a little boy with loaves and fishes, ordinary lunch, ordinary little boy, and yet to know today he is known throughout the world because of what was achieved. And the reason for that is that Jesus was there, and Jesus took the ordinary lunch of loaves and fishes from the little boy, and he displayed this wonderful message of sharing. And because of that, 5,000 people were indeed fed. 5,000 people were taught that they should share what they have with others. And in a sense, it's incredible to think that what you have is simply an ordinary little boy, an ordinary lunch, used in such a way. And today, when we think about them and the way that Jesus used them, then they have become famous in their own right. And it's great that when you think about it, God, Jesus, can use people, they can use ordinary things and achieve very special accomplishments. And you know, the wee boy in the story, who we now know about, in many respects, when you think about him and his ability to share his lunch, he truly was, on that particular day, a real local hero. In our thoughts, let us come before God with a word of prayer. 
Heavenly Father, <clears throat> we often live in a world dominated by the glitz and glamour of the rich and famous, where the ambitions of many are to find fame and wealth. And yet, in your eyes, we are all equal. In your eyes, we are all special, part of your creation. And therefore, Lord God, help each and every one of us to acknowledge that we are important to you, that although we may often look upon ourselves as ordinary individuals, when we follow your ways, the tasks that are before us are so important and so worthwhile. Indeed, this day we have focused on how an ordinary little boy with a very ordinary lunch gained fame because of his unselfish nature. A little boy who shames so many adults by his willingness to hand over his loaves and fishes, through which he enabled Jesus to relay a wonderful message that promoted the need to share. And so, Heavenly Father, remind us that when we speak or carry out a task in the name of Jesus, then our words and actions are special. Therefore, help us to be the disciples of Christ in our world today not to seek fame, but to ensure the message of Christ continues to resonate wherever His followers are to be found. And in Christ's name, may we unite as your people in many ways an ordinary group who seek to carry out a very special task. And therefore, in Christ's name, hear us now as we come before you collectively to say the words of our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now we come to our next hymn of praise, Praise the One Who Breaks the Darkness. <laughs>
And now we come to the intimations. Firstly, just to say that I'm hoping to do a September newsletter and yearbook very shortly, so any articles should really be with me by the close of this service, or if you can email them over the next 24 hours, that would be great. As always, just thanks to everyone that continues to donate to the food bank. Just a reminder that Elaine Duncan from the Scottish Bible Society will be at Moncton and Presswick North tomorrow between 2 and 4. You will also note that there's an intimation for the first time about a christening gown exhibition in Aerokirk. Now, apparently, Aerokirk a few months ago had an exhibition on wedding dresses, and it was incredibly popular. Lots and lots of people went along to see the wedding dresses. So they've decided to repeat this, albeit this time it's not weddings, but baptisms, which are very much central. So the intimation is on print for Friday the 2nd and Saturday the 3rd of September. And for all those who perhaps are interested in embroidery, uh, crochet, etc., then please make a note of that. As always, tea and coffee will be served in the hall immediately after the service. And you will note that we have once again the citation to appear at Presbytery for Presswick South Parish Church. All congregations have been asked to have representatives at Presbytery this coming Tuesday night. And the reason for that is because there is a Presbytery Mission Plan that is seeking approval. And as you will be aware, there are various challenges facing the Church of Scotland at this moment in time. And therefore, because of that, over the last year, there has been a lot of work looking towards the future and how the church can function and indeed, in a sense, in certain locations, survive over the next few decades. And so we are cited to attend. Now, we already have three people from the congregation who will be attending. We are allowed a maximum of five, so there is still place for another two. And if you are interested in attending, then I would suggest at the close of the service, if you speak to our session clerk, Alan, about this, then, um, then possibly you would be able to attend. In light of the citation, can I also say that I am anticipating that there will be a congregational meeting next Sunday immediately following the service regarding an update in the way forward. So for all members of the congregation, I'm anticipating we will get together after the service next Sunday for an update. Now, that concludes all the intimations which are in print this morning, but just to finish on a really joyful note, and although it's not in print, and we used to do this in Presswick South before COVID hit, um, can I just announce that two people who are with us this morning, Andy and Ella Mitchell, um, they celebrated their 60th wedding anniversary on Thursday, and so from everyone here at Presswick South, we convey our congratulations to both Andy and Ella. And I know they've had family celebrations over the past week, but it's nice for us this morning to convey our own congratulations to, to them. And I can see Hugh's primed to clap, so let's give them a clap. It's always nice to celebrate these things. Well, that leads me nicely, in a sense, on to our first reading today, a slightly different order of service. This is a reading from the Old, the Old Testament. And Andy and Ella have spent 60 years together, no doubt, most of the time in harmony. Well, our reading today is about another couple who in this instance didn't always see eye to eye. This is David and Michal. Now, Michal was the daughter of Saul, and he was David's predecessor as the king. And the relationship between David and Saul wasn't that great. Um, but 
it's like a good soap opera, this. Um, David actually married Saul's daughter. And in this occasion, David was completely overjoyed that the Ark of the Covenant was been brought into his new capital, which was Jerusalem. And therefore, to celebrate, he offered worship to God, whereby he was leaping and dancing, which did not get the approval of his wife, as we will hear, and Margaret's going to read this. As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michal, daughter of Saul, watched from a window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before the Lord. After he had finished sacrificing the burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord Almighty. Then he gave a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, and a cake of raisins to each person in the whole crowd of Israelites, both men and women, and all the people went to their homes. When David returned home to bless his household, Michal, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, disrobing in the sight of the slave girls of his servants as any vulgar fellow would. David said to Michal, it was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. Amen. And may God add his blessing to this holy, his holy word. Well, this week, despite all the gloomy news that is around, one of the most sought-after revelations was made known to the public. I am, of course, talking about the disclosure <coughs> of all 15 individuals who will appear on Strictly Come Dancing this year. The popular program will return to our screens next month, and for many people, Saturday nights will now revolve around the glitter and the sequence that this colorful program brings to the small screen. Now, <clears throat> I must confess, and I know I've said this before, I'm not a fan. <laughs> but I'm naturally aware of how popular this program is. And I have to say, perhaps my reflection and my lack of interest is, if I'm honest, I'm not a great dancer. Uh, in fairness, I like a Kaylee at a wedding, but that's about the extent of my involvement with dancing. And yet, I'm aware we're all different. And hence, the huge interest in Strictly Come Dancing by many, while people like me won't really be bothered. Now, I suppose it's further proof that we all have different pursuits and pleasures in life. What is attractive to one person may not be to another. And you know, that can also be apparent in the way we wish to behave and what characteristics our personalities wish to display. And it can be apparent within the whole concept also of worship. After all, the Presbyterian style of worship that most of us are dear to tends, if we're honest, to be quite reserved. Take the singing of hymns. We are all generally fairly static. Indeed, to even get to the stage of clapping our hands at a modern hymn is generally against the norm. And yet, as we know, in some modern churches, there is a very active response to the whole concept of worship. Not just clapping, but also hands in the air. 
Now, certainly I believe that for worship to resonate with individuals, it generally requires an atmosphere and a location that people are comfortable with. But by the same token, we have to accept diversity within worship and that different people are at liberty to respond in different ways. It's down to taste and temperament. What moves one may leave another completely cold. And if we look hard enough, that mode of thought is actually encapsulated in the Bible. Although I'm not sure we always truly acknowledge that. In our first reading of King David, we heard all about his public display of worship. Now, the occasion, as we heard, was the bringing of the Ark of the Covenant into his new capital, namely Jerusalem. To David, this was a great occasion, and it was worthy of an expression of Jewish worship, to the extent that we are told that David was leaping and dancing before God. That was an expression of the joy that he felt on this occasion. And yet, not everyone shared his expressive style of worship. Indeed, you will remember that Saul had once been the king and had fell out of favor with God, after which David had grown in prominence, leading to a troubled relationship with Saul. However, to further complicate matters, Saul's daughter, Michal, had married David. And together, it has to be said that the relationship was fairly good. However, in her reading, she took exception to the leaping and the dancing of David before God. She found it incredibly demeaning. It wasn't how she believed worship should be conducted especially by a king. And yet, as we heard, David just couldn't contain his emotions. Sure, he was the king, but at the end of the day, he was also human, like you and me. He was just so overjoyed to see the Ark of the Covenant coming into Jerusalem, and he responded in a very expressive way as far as worship was concerned. Well, today, as alluded to, contrasting attitudes to worship can certainly continue. And inevitably, we're all different. There is not really a wrong way, and nor should there be an attempt by one group to impose a form of worship on others. And yes, we need awe, we need reverence, we need order, and at times I also believe we need quietness but there also has to be a place in our worship for joy, to laugh, to smile, if required to pour out our praise, to express our gratitude to God. For sometimes our emotions are a reflection not always of what we display on the outside, but how we actually feel in the inside. Whether we are open to worship not just with our physical characteristics, but also with our hearts and our minds, where at times we can feel deep down a real sense of joy, and even if we don't want to dance, we can at least express emotions of happiness and contentment. And also, just to take this briefly, just a wee bit further, I often think with any service, within any service, when we bring our gifts before God, that is the one place above all others within our worship where perhaps our emotions should be allowed to surface. For you know, our gifts each Sunday are a poignant and a simple reminder in a world of great need and deprivation that we are actually so fortunate fortunate to the extent that we can bring a portion of our surplus 
to God's presence, symbolizing what we have in life. And therefore, as we now seek to dedicate our offering, let us give thanks for the diversity of worship that allows all of God's followers to come before Him in praise and in joy. And may this wonderful opportunity also be accompanied by the realization that what we have in life is rich in comparison to the little so many have in a world of great need. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, for the opportunity each week to engage with a service of worship, we offer our thanks. Acknowledging that such an essential part of our faith is to express our thoughts, our concerns, and our emotions within the confines of worship. And may we also continually recognize that worship allows for diversity, encouraging people to come before you in a sincere manner that reflects different approaches to praising and glorifying your name. We also acknowledge that our service provides an opportunity for all of us to express the value of our faith in a practical and generous way. For an essential part of our worship is our offering, the part of the service that allows us to give rather than to receive. And therefore, we pray that our offerings, those offerings that are brought before you, may, be done so, may, may we do so with joyful and grateful hearts, full of appreciation for what we have within our lives. For whatever challenges face us, we are surrounded with comfort, with food, with shelter, with assistance when required, and with love. And so, Heavenly Father, may the words of our prayer now be reflected in the giving of this offering and in the emotions we express, both of joy and of gratitude. And all of this we ask in your name. Amen. And now to continue the theme of gratitude, we sing our next hymn, Now Thank We All Our God.
And now we come to our second reading today, our New Testament reading, which is from the Gospel of John. Two very short but important verses. Uh, John chapter 12 and beginning at verse 35. You are going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. The man who walks in the dark does not know where he is going. Put your trust in the light while you have it, so that you may become sons of light. When he had finished speaking, Jesus left and hid himself from them. Amen. And thanks be to God for both the readings from his holy word. During the summer months, especially for those of us that live in Presswick, we all have the opportunity to walk along the seafront. And I have to say, particularly in Ayrshire, it, it can be very uplifting. The beach, the waves either coming in or going out, depending on the tide. And plus, there's a huge variety of different backgrounds um, that emerge, depending on whether you're looking out towards Arran or you're looking along the coast towards Ayr. There's a sense in which we are just so fortunate. And yet, I noticed this year that in Presswick, if I'm honest, and I'm not wishing to incur the wrath of the local council, um, but the beach is not as clean as in previous years. In the recent past, as you may be aware, a tractor and a trailer were often seen in the beach first thing in the morning sweeping up all the debris, the stones, the rubbish, etc., which also ensured that the beach conveyed the pleasing sight of golden sand as opposed to other items. And sadly, this year it's been different. So much so that I've noticed if you walk along the front in Presswick, then your impression of the shoreline can actually be dependent on the tide. For on a clear day when the sky is blue and the tide is in, everything actually looks great. The water sparkling, reflecting the sky and the sound of the waves nearby. And yet when the tide goes out, it can paint, paint a different picture. For it is then that whatever is washed up in the beach is visible for all to see. And sadly, that doesn't always convey the most attractive scene. Which just goes to show that when the tide comes in, it can disguise the reality of the situation. Well, you know, I suppose people can be a wee bit like that. I'm sure that we've all asked a friend or a family member at one stage or another, how are you feeling? And they have replied in a positive way, and yet we know underneath that that is perhaps not the true picture. They are speaking as if the tide is in, covering up their fears and their concerns. And perhaps we too have been in that situation. We're asked how we feel, and instead of being honest that, you know, things could be better, we try and we cover it up with, everything's fine. And yet, underneath it all, instead of walking in the water, we are floundering on the beach. I believe everyone experiences occasions like that. And certainly, Jesus was also aware, I believe, of that kind of scenario. In his case, he didn't use the tide being in or the tide being out, but the premise was the same. In this instance, as recorded in John's gospel, Jesus spoke of darkness and light. He referred to the fact that if you feel surrounded by darkness, then you can become disorientated and despondent. But if there is a light, then everything changes. You can not only see where you are, but you can see 
where you are going. And let's not forget, Jesus also described himself as the light of the world, asking us, his followers, to put our whole trust in him so that when things happen and they're not going the way that people want, they are still able to appreciate that underneath all the feelings of fear, anxiety, and suffering, all is not lost. That just as the tide always turns, darkness always gives way to light. And of course, Jesus proved that by His life and His resurrection here in this earth, providing us with the reassurance that if we hold on to His promises and follow His guidance, then whatever we or our loved ones face, we have a God and a Savior for whom despair and misery are never the last word. Let me finish this morning with a little parable just to make you think. Once upon a time, a cave lived underground, and it spent its lifetime in darkness. One day the cave heard a voice, come up into the light, come and see the sunshine. The cave replied, I don't know what you mean, there isn't anything else but darkness. Well, finally, the cave decided to venture forth and was surprised to see that there was actually light everywhere. And looking up at the sun, the cave said, come and see the darkness, to which the sun replied, what is darkness? The cave replied, come and see. And so one day, the sun accepted the invitation. As I entered the cave, it said, now show me your darkness. But there was no darkness to be seen. As Jesus said, put your trust in the light. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, we accept that life is there to create joyful and everlasting memories where we are able to both appreciate the present and reflect in the past with smiles on our faces. Walking in the sunshine surrounded by beauty and wonder, therefore may your goodness give us an appreciation of life that is generally full of happiness and wonderful recollections. And when the darkness threatens, when our view of life is distorted, may we never feel alone and may we never lose hope. For through the life of Christ, we have been given an eternal light that shines in the darkness. And so for all who at this moment in time feel shrouded by the dark, may our prayers help to illuminate the way forward. We pray for those currently struggling with their feelings, where depression and unhappiness threaten to extinguish their joy of life. We pray for those who are suffering from ill health and disease, where pain and suffering threaten to encroach their ability to live life to the full. We pray for those who are terminally ill and where uncertainty and fear highlight the mortality of humanity. O oh Lord, for those mentioned in all in need, remind us of your eternal kingdom. Remind us that sorrow, that separation, that death is never the end, for the light of Christ is eternal, a light that will continue to shine both in this world and in the next. And so hear our prayer this day, May all in need experience comfort, hope, and the realization that the darkness and despair will always succumb to the light and the life. And all of this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Well, thank you once again for being part of this service of worship today and for those in Presswick South just a reminder that tea and coffee will be served in the hall 
immediately the service concludes. But now we bring this part to a conclusion by singing our final hymn, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. And now go out to the world in peace and in joy, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, may they be with you and those whom you love this day and forevermore.